Check, 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 I'm good. So I'm Max Ron, Max, Max Ron, CWB Association Welding Podcast, Pod, Pod, Podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. Hello and welcome to another edition of the CWB Association podcast. As you have been listening, we are always trying to find a wide variety of guests. And today we are very happy and excited to have Leah Arapach here with us to talk about her amazing work and the stuff she does. And I have a pile of questions. I've been following your career for a while. So welcome, Leah. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm do- I'm doing good. It's actually a hot muggy day where I am, but I'm I'm like a weird person that likes hot and muggy. So I am too, actually. I'm kind of a lizard like that. Uh, mm-hmm. Northern California is kind of a nice balance, but I lived in Savannah for three years, so I was pretty used to the heat and humidity. <laughs> yeah, no, I dig it too. Like I'm from Chile, and it's hot and and mm. uh, I feel like I'm very akin to my lizards. I have a turtle, so we we chill all the time in the sun. Nice. <laughs> I had a bearded dragon for a long time. She was a huge, and her name was Bella. She was how, how huge? Because I know some of them can get like huge, huge. Um, she was about twenty-four inches. She was a pretty big lizard. Wow! Did she have her own room in the house? She did. She had a special, uh, special, beautiful tank, and then she, we would let her roam around during the day too, if she wanted mm-hmm. to. That's awesome. People don't yeah. know, or realize, or don't they don't want to know. That how intelligent the, the lizards are. People yeah. think that lizards are just like these like eat and poop animals that just like crawl around and they don't realize the attachments and the, the you know that the lizards have and the way they can communicate without talking. They're like they are very well evolved, you know. Yeah, they're pretty funny too. I mean, she had mm-hmm. a, a very specific personality, and um I would take her out of the cage at night and put her on my chest and she'd pass out on me while we watch TV and she was very like she liked to be held and handled and social so she was snuggly yeah <laughs> which is <laughs> not something you think about when you think of lizards or reptiles no. in general <laughs> yeah no my turtle's pretty snuggly too she's like super spoiled she has like an outside pen and inside pen so yeah, yeah. <laughs> the works yeah so let's talk about where you are right now you're in California you said northern California yeah i'm in Oakland California and is that what where you call home base uh, or like where did you I guess where were you born? What, where are your roots? I'm from Montauk, New York, um, which is a tiny, tiny town at the very end of Long Island. Um, yeah, it was like a town of 2000 people when I grew up there uh, mm-hmm. and grew up there, left when I was 18, went to Savannah, Georgia for three years and then um, transferred schools out to the Bay Area. And then while I was in school out here, I met my husband and we settled down in Oakland. And what did you go to school for initially when you went to Georgia? Um, so the answer I told my parents was that I was going to be an architect. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how they that's how I got away with letting them them letting you me move go. away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then I pretty much immediately changed my major to painting. Um, but uh, while I was there, they want you to be somewhat cross-disciplinary. So I took a sculpture class and I kind of fell in love with it. Um, and I was still kind of holding on to my identity as a painter, but was getting very interested in sculpture. So I started kind of minoring in sculpture while I was there as well. And, and you know, I find this even at this point already fascinating because I, I, I'm learning about art. I'm a late bloomer in the art scene. So I was a musician when I was younger and I kind of understand music also in terms of layers and depth and, you know, yeah. like in, in these angles. Right. But I, I've never been much of a visual artist. And my daughter is extremely artistic and I work with so many artists that I have now started to understand the concept of depth within art. Not just like the simple depth, like, hey, that's 3D house. Like, I can draw it so it looks like it has. But the actual using of, like, depth. So, like, I asked a friend of mine who's an artist to to do something for me for my office when I first got this job at CWB because it was the company Colors are Blue and I like having art and stuff. So she made me this abstract painting behind me. Yeah. And it's acrylic and there's a part of it that's probably an inch thick, you know, with, like, textured whites and blues. Yep. And... 
I don't know much, but it gave me feelings, you know, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, like that, that makes it different. And then when I think of sculpture, I feel like sculpture is kind of already has depth by just nature. Like you're starting with a three-dimensional object that you are now working into something else. And for you to go from painting into sculpturing, is that a stretch? Is that something like most painters don't do that jump or is it something like they kind of hold hands? Uh, I think that they can be, they can kind of hold hands. And I think that uh, what you're saying is really astute. Like when you're a painter, you're making an illusion of something. Mm -hmm. um, and so what actually drew me to sculpture was the idea that with sculpture, you're making something. You're making it in the same dimension that you exist in. It's not an illusion. It is something that now exists with us in this world. And so I really like that about it. And that's, um, but I, I feel like a lot of the stuff that I learned in drawing classes and in painting classes really lends to strengthening me as a sculpture because you're doing a lot of analysis of the form, being able to read planes and have to know that pretty well. And then that just kind of parlayed into a pretty good understanding of that, those same principles in sculpture. So as a kid growing up, you obviously were into art. You were like that art artsy kid. Or were you, no. what were your interests in? Um, when I was a kid, I spent a lot of my time just hanging out in the woods, uh, catching frogs and insects. Being, being and, weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the swamps around my house. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up on the abandoned Air Force base that uh, was basically the the inspiration for Stranger Things, the TV show. Um, so I spent a lot of time hanging out in abandoned buildings over there, even though we weren't supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, that, that makes it so fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was it was pretty creepy back there and weird. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, our our area was the absolute destination neighborhood for Halloween and trick or treating. So I think I've always had this like creepy energy in me. And uh, mm -hmm. so, but you know, uh, as far as artistic. Uh, my my connection my connection to art um my parents were both pretty creative although they were more like my mom was really good at sewing and painting and my dad was definitely like a, a woodworker and he's a mechanic so um super handy and always doing things projects and whatnot but um i didn't have any artistic talent like even going no. into art school i was learning how to draw there i wasn't one of those kids that went into art school um good at anything so <laughs> like just like super doodler in grade five, really like, wow, because we all know those kids, you know, you're yeah, in grade for sure. six and there's some kid that can already do like copy the thing out of the magazine, like perfectly just yeah. looking at it. It's like that, that wasn't you. No, no. <laughs> and kind of, you know, I, I know that kid and I don't think that kid actually went on to be a, an artist, you know, yeah, it's yeah. it's more about it becomes more about passion as you get older, what you're willing to spend your time doing and uh and education. Like I, I tell people a lot that, um, you know, I, I was taught how to do this. It's not, you know, it's not natural talent. It's, it's learning these, these different techniques and processes along the way, taking classes. And, um, that's how I've come to be the artist that I am, you know? Yeah. It's not always, it's not always that you do what you're good at, but sometimes you have to be good at what you do. Right. So it's yeah. like, you're going to have to play that line back and forth. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, you know, I was good at math and science when I was a kid. And I, I guess that plays a role as mm -hmm. be, especially on the fabrication end of things. Um, but uh, I didn't become an astrophysicist like my parents would have liked, you know. <laughs> that's, very, that's very specific. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they had very specific desires, but I, I don't think that they wanted me to become a metal sculptor, which is literally the <laughs> the least lucrative thing you can do <laughs> well you never know i i've had some older sculptors on here i uh, just interviewed a few weeks ago uh ken kevin stone and he's doing oh, huge yeah. like multi-million dollar sculptures like so like yeah. I mean, eh, it's it's just a matter of time i think and that's the thing with art is like it's not a product it's like at like you can scale it's not like hey look i made this one thing Walmart wants 60,000 of them now. It's not like that. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a very difficult scaling process, especially in terms of monetization. So. Yeah. And I think that that's something that I'm actually kind of working on right now. Like I've, mm -hmm. I, 
I was trying to prove the concept that if I made something simple and I took a design once and built that sculpture five times, that I could spread that design time over five pieces. And by the end, if I treated it like a production instead of building one-offs, which is what I usually do, that I would make such good time that I could make a very affordable sculpture. And my goal was to make something that would be under a thousand dollars because mm -hmm. art can also be so expensive, especially mm -hmm. when we're talking about, you know, high-end metal work and you know, we all know what the overhead of that looks like and what our costs are to even make the work in general. So um, I did it and it was, you know, it wasn't as exciting as, you know, doing one piece and getting mm -hmm. to do whatever you want. But uh, I love the idea that people were able to afford small pieces. And so I'm trying to do that. I'm doing a run of work right now. Um, that's like an outdoor sculpture. So it's even less detailed and maybe mm -hmm. can be even more affordable. So I'm I think that it's good. My business plan anyways, is to have a, a really broad range of uh, prices so that you can well, kind of have. If yeah. you look at art artists historically, I'm a lover of history. You look at like the Picassos or the Da Vinci's and, and they, they're famous for their, let's say 15 to 20 masterpieces but people forget that they did street art and they were yeah. pumping off profiles and caricatures and doing the weekend newspaper comics. And, you know, they they also had to feed themselves. They can't yeah. all just produce the masterpieces. They they produced hundreds of thousands of pieces of art that just went out into the community just to just to put food on the table. And that's also important and valid because you're still working your skill and speed, time, efficiency. Those are all parts of the skill train that is yeah. part of any gig, right? If if you want to sit on your couch and just produce the one masterpiece that you sell once and it makes you set for life, you better have a good backer or rich parents or something. Because like, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not really yeah. how that works, right? Right. Well, and also like, that's a good point. Like a lot of those artists did have one major patron and that was the person that was buying those bigger pieces, but mm -hmm. all of that smaller work that we do, um, to put food on the table is also how we're honing our craft. You know, right. if I bought, if I build five of something, I can really test myself and, and have really positive feedback about how I'm making time or how I'm doing with the fabrication techniques. Um, just seeing from piece to piece to piece. So, I think that it's important for, you know, monetizing what we do, but it's also important for just getting, becoming a better artist, you know? Yeah. And the workload, just keeping busy, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So let's go back to Georgia. So we were in Georgia. You went there to be an architect, you know, quote unquote. <laughs> um, you said you weren't an artist. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to envision this timeline. Of you driving or flying to Georgia with your backpack and your, you know, Architect 101 book in your bag that you showed your mom to be like, look, and <laughs> you show up to college. You said you weren't really into art. So was there a moment? Did something happen? Did you meet someone? Did you take a class, an elective? What was the deal that pulled you from what your you thought was going to be a vocation to to the uh, fine arts world? Um, well, I, I, I got pretty into art in high school, so okay. I, I was into art on my way, but I, I wasn't really into it as a kid. I guess that's what mm -hmm. I meant. Like when I was, okay. you know, 17, 18, I started getting very interested in art. Um, got it. so that was pr probably the catalyst was just sort of a coming of age thing where I started mm -hmm. finding myself and understanding what felt important to me or what I wanted to spend my time and energy towards. Mm -hmm. So I was painting when I was in high school, but, okay. you know, I was going into it. the <laughs> fine arts. Like, I mean, I have a, I went to university for philosophy, so that's off the beaten path. And yeah, <laughs> when you, and, and fine arts, my daughter's a fine arts major, you know, you go into, into fine arts. It's a, it's not just an educational thing. It's cultural too. You're like mm. surround yourself with the type of people that are now in kind of the same space. What was it like for you to be in university? What was the university experience like in Georgia going through fine arts? Oh, man, I'm having these visions of Oglethorpe House coming back to me right now. We're, that's <laughs> where we stayed when we were freshmen, and it was just mm -hmm. a madhouse. <laughs> um, I mean, 
I, th I think it is an, an interesting culture and you have a bunch of angsty, sensitive people that are creative and they're being tested, you know, maybe they're coming from schools where they were the art kid and they were really, really good there. And then they get to SCAD and they're in a pool of really talented drawers and they might not be placing where they think they are. So, mm -hmm. um, and every time you go do a critique, it's not just that you're doing finals, which we're always like so incredibly intense, but uh, <laughs> then you have to do a critique and you've put your blood, sweat and tears into this piece. And then your teacher's just like, nah, uh, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. So it was dramatic is what I would call it dramatic. <laughs> There's a lot of drama all the time in art school, but it was cool. That's where I learned how to work hard. You know, mm -hmm. you college is, uh, people this college. I'm not a disser of anything. I'm just in it for you. If we'll, we'll meet someday and you'll, cause I'm always traveling and this is something about me is I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how to be negative. It's a total toxic trait of mine that everything <laughs> is like for a reason or for some type of purpose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I loved college. I loved going to university. And even though I ended up in the trades and I became a welder and I went down that path, I never look at my college experience as negative because learning to be critiqued in a face-to-face -face setting and, and learning to understand that and expect it and digest it and learn from it. And, and then even with your, with your, your peers is a, is, it's like a beautiful experience to get good at. You know, because that's really what you learn in college is like, okay, there's the history. There's going to be, you know, these are the forms, these are the techniques, and there's all that stuff that's laid out. That's the same in any discipline, you know, the rules and the, the, the generalizations. But then there's also, and hopefully if you have a great teacher, which most colleges do, they'll have that teacher that starts pulling that that deep stuff out of you. You're, you're not even sure it was in there, and then it starts coming out. And that's when you start realizing that your path is slightly different from everyone around you. And you do have something to contribute, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that, I, I mean, I, per, personally, I got a an expensive, it took me seven years to get my BFA in fine mm -hmm. art, which is insane. Um, that's probably just too much partying. I'll say it, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, for, you know, what wound up happening was transferring after going to a school for three years every school believes that their foundations are better than the ones that you just came from. So mm. they, when I transferred to Academy of Art University, they wanted me to redo foundations, but I'm really glad that they did. And then that's when I was still there, I was a painting major still, and then had to be talked into going into the sculpture program. So their program is technically five years. I did it in four because I did summer okay. classes. So, but yeah, still seven years. And uh, I, I don't know, I don't regret any moments of it, but it wasn't, you know, private art schools are extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. And so I struggle with the accessibility or lack of accessibility of that kind of education, but I had really excellent teachers and they really yeah. made it worth it for me. And, you know, more than just teachers, they were mentors, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, when you said getting talked into sculpture, <laughs> Who talked you into sculpture? Like, was that just like you wake up, you go to class, and your teacher's like, you know, put down the paintbrush. Come with me. <laughs> the clay in the woods over here. Like, <laughs> um, I mean, more or less. No, I, I started, I, I think that even when I was on my way out the door of SCAD, I was already dabbling in welding at that okay. school. And I was really into it, but I didn't have the heart to kind of go even deeper into the, like I was saying before, like a less lucrative field. So I was still very much so identifying as a painter when I went to Academy, but I went there because I knew they had a good metal arts program. Um, and so I started taking sculpture classes for all of my electives and the school, the sculpture teacher uh, set up a meeting between me and the director of the sculpture department at Academy. And he said, you're a sculptor. You're, you're, I mean, maybe you're a painter too, but you're definitely mm -hmm. a sculptor. And I said, that's fine. I, I'm inclined to agree with you, but I can't <laughs> do art school again. So <laughs> we're going to have to figure out a way to make some of these credits count towards my yeah. degree. So they, they worked with me on that. But yeah, that's what I mean about being talked into it. I mean, nobody had to twist my arm, but I was definitely counseled by the director who became a good mentor of mine um, that, I probably was not pursuing all of my passions by being a painter. And by the time you were done 
college and done being done college is a really scary tricky moment because it's like yeah i just spent a bunch of money learning to do things that i've never done before and now i have no money and i'm gonna need to prove that this was worth it which <laughs> i don't know even how to quantify that but you know what were your first steps coming out of the program you know you now have this degree you have this passion you're dabbling in metal work you know you can paint you know you can do these things what was the first steps for you so while I was graduate, yeah, I remember that moment. It was very, very terrifying. <laughs> While I was graduating, <laughs> I was working on a project. I was collaborating with an MFA fashion designer that was doing a line of clothing. She was working with a textiles designer, and they were doing a line of clothing for Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week in New York. So uh, I got tapped to jump into that collaboration. So my project, while I was at the very tail end of school, leading into... Uh, I just I graduated in December and um, Fashion Week was in February. I had that period of time to make a whole line of jewelry uh, to accompany her clothes going mm -hmm. down the runway. Um, and after that, it was into commercial fabrication shops for me and mostly mm -hmm. building furniture and architectural stuff. Which I so, think is actually very valuable because you learn a lot oh, yeah. in those there environments in terms of productivity and organization and all that stuff. Yes. Well, when you're in art school, you're not being taught how to weld. Um, they barely even let us change. They don't, they didn't even let us change out our own angle grinders. So you don't know anything when you leave mm -hmm. there. O only that that's what you want to do. Um, and then you go into a commercial shop and you get paid to learn more. Um, so it wasn't the first shop I went into, but the second one very briefly, like very shortly after I graduated, that uh, I landed in Brian Martin's shop. And Brian Martin um, basically made me the fabricator I am today. Like, I, he taught me mm -hmm. so much. He was so good. And we did such interesting projects together. Um, and in the time that I was there, like, I became lead fabricator. And that was a whole nother uh, set of lessons to learn about running your own business and running mm -hmm. a shop and, you know, at being able to allocate consumables and gas and what you're going to need for each project that you endeavor down. So I couldn't have done it without the commercial experience. That's, that was yeah. a very important component of where I'm at today. You know, I'm, when I look at your art, I see like, uh, and this is the untrained, unsophisticated Good. art. Good. Eye, <laughs> right. Uh, but I know steel, I know steel and I've worked with steel my whole life. And one of the things that immediately jumps out whenever I look at any of your works, and, and this is for a few months now that I've been kind of eyeing them up, is that you spend a lot of time on texture and like positioning, like on having a, the flow of the texture on the outside align with whatever's happening. You know, it, it, if it's teeth or, or movement or whatever it is, it all has a definite, you know, start and stop and, and an angle to it. That's not easy to do with steel. You know, that's not something that you pick up. And not, is how do you learn that? Is something is that something you learn in college? Was that something like an instructor was like, this is how you do this in steel and make this like the modeled skin or like, you know, looks like it scales. Or like, I mean, I've picked up a couple tricks, like, but nothing like that. <laughs> you know, like, so um, or is it just like trial and error with, you know, sitting in a backyard with a piece of steel and some wood and fire and. I mean, there's a lot of that for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely find your way artistically as you build your sculptures. Like I'm always learning as I'm building, you know, I like to mm -hmm. learn that way, but um, I learned how to sculpt in art school because I was also mm -hmm. doing ceramics and all these other things. I still work in clay, I still build every model in clay first so that I have a really good plan going into the shop. Um, and then in Brian's shop, I learned how to work with the material you know mm -hmm. um and i i learned how to fabricate so that's using geometry that's figuring out how to make something by using geometry and that's what sculpting is so mm -hmm. i think through that um yeah i mean that that was really an important part of it and then as far as like the textures go, I think maybe that was a little bit more as I started dabbling in blacksmithing and wanting things to feel more alive and having more uh, control over the material. Um, 
So it's sort of a combination of all three. I, honestly, like the, the, the texture that's on the outside of a lot of my pieces, I put it there because I know that the very last thing I'm going to have to do is use a burr to grind the very last weld in between mm -hmm. the teeth or wherever, like you're not going to be able to get in there with an angle grinder and sand it flat. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted that to be everywhere so that it really yeah. blended in and you could get away with that. Um, so that's really just a lot of burr work and it's the same texture over and over again. And um, now that's it's a lot really of time. Like yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I, you get good yeah. at kind of like having a, having a, a, a flow to it, you know, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It is. It is a lot of time. For sure. So you hit the streets, you work for Brian's shop, you're picking up the fab work. Sounds like you were there a few years because it didn't sound yeah. like to work your way up into a lead fabricator. Um, you know, that, that takes a bit of time and it's a lot of trust from your boss. I remember the first lead fabricator job I got and I was like, damn, I got to know, order all the materials now and check uh -huh. the ovens and know where <laughs> everything is. And, and it's a lot of responsibility, but it's, it's good. It's good for you. At, at this point, are you thinking in the back of your mind, my own shop because like i mean every artist wants their own studio every person wants their own space and you couldn't pick a more expensive medium to work mm. with yeah and that's one of the biggest drawbacks that i've seen people fail on both commercial and art in my whole life including myself in my first couple business attempts is underestimating the cost of running any type of metal workshop you you know you have these dreams oh i got a welder and an oxy fuel torch i can do everything mm. Not really, and not at the speed that you need to to make money or yeah. to survive even. So, you know, I, were you already starting to invest into like a home shop or how is the process of your space, you know, kind of path? Well, you know, Brian from day one was like, here's a key. When you're not working for me, you come in here and work for yourself. Like, wow. And so he was really awesome in that respect and mm -hmm. in, in, every, in every respect, honestly. Um but uh, so, so I, I did, I was able to use his welders. He never asked me for anything, not a dime for a consumable or gas or MIG wire, or whatever. Um, so I, I was working for him five days a week and then coming down to the shop uh, and doing my own work on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, and well, you know, it's, I live in Oakland and the sh his shop was in San Francisco. So the commute was not super ideal and was constantly getting worse. Traffic is really bad here. Mm. Um, but it was mostly about my husband um, saying, hey, I'd love it if you didn't work seven days a week for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'd love to see you more, you know, because mm -hmm. when I was in art school, I was, you couldn't get me out of the shop, you know, like yeah. there's never enough time to do what you're trying to do. So um, that gets old after, you know, years and years and years. So um, that was really about my husband talking me into starting my own space and investing in, uh, in that our business, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we, we accepted that we would take a loss for several years, but, we were able to take that on and, you know, now things are finally after I, seven years, things are finally starting to uh, prove lucrative, you know, mm -hmm. or I mean, mm -hmm. maybe I won't lose money this year. Let's put it that way. That's, <laughs> that's lucrative in my mind. Yeah, that's, a, that's lucrative for any artist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just to manage expectations. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah. And I've always ran a trim shop. So my, I've always had a, a fairly small square foot, square footage space and um, nothing that I don't need. Um, so I was able to mm -hmm. keep my overhead as low as possible, but it's still a lot as a, as a metal shop. You can't really get around that. No, it's, it's an, and even the cost of steel itself. And if you're working with brasses yeah. and bronzes and, and there's always the oopses and the, oh, that's garbage and oh, that didn't work or, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So this is going to be a really good time to take a break uh, for our, our, our supporters here and, and get a couple commercials in. We'll take a quick break and then we'll be right back here uh, with Leah Arapoch on uh, the CWB Association podcast. Don't go anywhere. 
All right, and we are back here on the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Ceron, and we got Leah Arapach here, and I've said it three different ways now, so <laughs> hopefully one of them's right. I wrote it yeah. down with, like, phonetic right. spellings here. But, uh... <laughs> I'm <laughs> and, not picky. We've been talking about your, your kind of life leading up to where you are right now. You know, you went to school for art, which is, which is commitment to the art already. So this is something that you were, like, already committed to, you know. And you pick the medium of steel and sculpture as kind of where you want to go. You talked about you having a bit of a creepy soul since the start from the marshes of northern U.S., northeast U.S. there. And that is very much represented in, in your art. You know, there's there's a lot of creepy, crawly stuff in, involved. And and, uh, and and this is all part of the package of, of what it is your art. Now, today where are you at you know you said you have your your shop do you have you know what's it does it have a company name what's what's going on um well these days i'm exclusively working on sculptures um i my shop is leah arapach studios i don't know just i needed a dba whatever yeah um (laughs) uh i'm in a shop with the three other metal workers. One is a bladesmith and he was the one that sort of dragged me into the, dragged me in front of the forge, um, mm-hmm. kicking and screaming. Cause I was like, I'm a fabricator. I know how to do this without, you know, I can metal. conform. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I, and then I got sick of that and, you know, doing hours and hours and hours of it. So I, uh, I started putting things into the forge and, and shaping that way. And, uh, so I guess, uh, I, that was back in 2019. So the last few years have been kind of consumed by uh, being new at blacksmithing and mm-hmm. trying to learn as much as I can, going to a lot of events, um, making friends with a lot of bladesmiths. <laughs> Most of my friends are bladesmiths for whatever yeah, and, reason. And, the, and, and I hope no one gets offended, but they're kind of an odd bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why I get along with them. Because <laughs> yeah, I I've been a part of some uh, blacksmithing podcasts and shows and conventions. Because I'm a metallurgy guy, so I'm like considered yeah. like a, I know metallurgy really well. So I don't know anything about blacksmithing, but I do know things about metallurgy. So when people ask me things, I can answer on that end of it. Like awesome. you know, like with the colors and the stuff and what'll fuse, I can figure out that chemical side. But. Uh, but I, I get a kick out of these guys and the people that are in them there and the work they do. I don't, it's amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. And they're, <laughs> I mean, as far as like the, the blacksmithing um, association that I belong to is the California blacksmithing association. I mean, I also um, am a member of Abana, but uh, mm-hmm. the California blacksmithing association is so awesome. Everyone is Ooh. weird. Everyone is cool. Everyone's yeah. down to have a good time and show people things. So um, I think that, you know, beyond working on my sculptures in my shop, I'm starting to get to an age reluctantly that <laughs> I'm, <laughs> cause I still feel very young. I'm 35 and I'm yeah. you know, very new to blacksmithing and I feel like it's a time to learn, but um, there has been, a desire for me to show people how I'm doing what I'm doing. And so that was my, I, I did my first demonstration this past weekend at a hammer in. And I think that moving forward, there's going to be a little bit more of a focal point on mentorship and so starting to give back to the community and figuring out how to um, help people avoid like really expensive art school. If they know they want to be a metal sculptor, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, having that accessibility is huge, and associations are how you do it. I mean, yeah. that's but the podcast we're on right now. I mean, I run an association. It's a not-for-profit funded through welding. And my whole purpose in life now is to help pass on and spread knowledge and be a mentor, even if it is through the airwaves, you know, or at least connect people with people like yourselves for mentorship opportunities. Because in my career, in 30 years in steel, I know very specifically who the people are that mentored me and who contributed to my career. And there's no way anyone gets anywhere alone. You have people help you. And in some cases, you pay. Like you go to university and you pay for someone to help you. But in the and most of my positive experiences, like the best experiences, it was people on job sites that I would meet and they are super awesome, helpful and take you aside and talk to you. And, 
And I wish everyone had those experiences. And I think you're getting to that age now where you're like, I need to start helping with that because mentorship is huge. Mentorship yeah. is a huge thing, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, a lot of people, because my narrative leading up to this demonstration was I'm not ready. Um, I'm too young <laughs> and I still have a lot to learn. And mm -hmm. they said that never goes away. You feel that way your entire life and you'll never feel ready. But if you start doing it, you'll learn whether you like it or not. And, you know, that's how you get good at it is by doing it. And it's like, yeah, duh, of course, that's yeah. the case with all of this stuff. You know, like no one mm -hmm. comes out of the gates a good teacher without having done it i mean people go to school for that so yeah. um there's definitely i wasn't sure if i was gonna like it but i really really enjoyed it and i was able to connect with some young uh, in particular one young um aspiring young lady aspiring metal sculptor and uh that makes those experiences completely worth it for me because mm -hmm. i know how many people stand behind me and have put me on their shoulders and helped me through, you know, my career. And I, I, you know, Brian was my main mentor, but I had many people helping me. And that's, you know, that seems to be a common denominator for people that feel like they've, you know, done well and that they're, you know, at a place that they want to be. They had a lot of people helping them get there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you never know how hard it is for some people. So people really go out on a limb. They show up at a, you know, at an event on a weekend. They find it through like Eventbrite or Facebook or whatever, being like, hey, I want you. And you don't know that that might be the only moment in that person's life to come out as something positive. And if you can make that a positive experience, you might be changing someone's life huge. And you have no idea. And yeah. I just like even thinking about that. Like, what if I just, wh why I try to not be an anywhere you know what? <laughs> yeah <laughs> because you never know someone might be having like the worst month of their life they stumble into some course that they're just like whatever i'm gonna i already signed up i don't i guess i'll go and if you can make that a really good experience you can maybe spin it you know you can just spin that whole thing out and be like you know what this is a focus you know what? maybe not for life but maybe for the next three months of your life you're gonna get really into this yeah. and then move on but that's fine because good you know that's that's better than nothing, right? And better than going backwards, which I, it's an ugly thing. So I don't, I'm, I'm getting emotional. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I think that that's, uh, you know, we, I don't, I don't do this for the money. I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I don't do this for anything other than sort of having found a place to kind of leave an impact and wanting to have a, a meaningful, uh, thing to do and and I think that inspiring young artists and giving them the time of day when they come up to your table and start talking to you I just have to make an assumption that that's going to be that moment for them and I try mm -hmm. to do the best that I can because what if it is just that one time you know mm -hmm. even if you talk to hundreds of people if you can impact one person's life I mean that's that's a huge box to check off your my list yeah. anyways yeah. of what I want out of my life, you yeah. know, because I know how many people were with me at turning points in my life and how much that meant to me. Years ago, when I was working at a college, I had um, this crazy experience. And I don't know. I don't think I brought it up on any other shows, but mm -hmm. I was doing these weekend classes because, you know, they would ask teachers like who wants to work on a Saturday to just do like hobby classes. And I always signed up for those. I loved it. It was fun. It was like a one day course. You come in, I show you how to do Megan's thick give you access to the scrap bins, build stuff. And you'd have, you know, all sorts of different people come in for a one day class and they just get to basically safety, how to not kill yourself with a welder kind of class and play with stuff, pack some things together, make a cup holder, go home. And it was always kind of fun. People would get it creative and there was, you know, I would take pictures of what they did. And I had this old fella and he was like 60 some years old. And he's like, Oh, I love this class so much. It's so much fun. And I'm like, well, that's good. And he's like, you know, there's nothing for retired people we have nothing to do like we are so bored <laughs> and we feel so excluded because everything yeah. else is too fast or too quick and it's like or it's a lot of young people and that's really intimidating for us and i was like damn i went back to my boss and i thought about it and i was like can we run one of these just for like retired only like 
and do it for no cost. Like, I'll see if I can find some funding. I got together some funding and we ran a class. It was a, we did it over two days, like a Saturday and Sunday. And I actually brought the local blacksmiths on the one day to do a little four hour presentation on blacksmithing. And everyone got to make a little keychain thing. And it was just retired people. And I was one of the best experiences of my life because I had forgotten about that demographic in my world. I was like, mentor the young, mentor the young, get young people into welding, get young people into the trades. But what about all these old people that retire and their kids have moved away and there's no grandkids and maybe they're not even, maybe they're immigrants, they're not even from here. They don't have the aunts and the uncles or the brothers and the cousins and they don't have nothing to do. A hobby and getting, and, and steel working, any, like there's a bazillion hobbies within steel world. You know, th this could be something for them to do. You can buy a little low cost welder at, you know, your local hardware store for a couple hundred bucks now. And you could be that guy on the block that makes the clothes hangers for everybody or the you know, boot scrapers or, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, and I really thought about that for a long time and I've made it part of my like ongoing thing. Like, don't forget about the other end. Don't forget about old people or veterans or whatever it is you could do, you know? Yeah, that's a really good point. And I mean, you know, you're making me think about, I, I wouldn't say that they were necessarily retired, but I, when I was in art school uh, at Academy, there were masters there, people in the master's program doing metal arts that were well into their 60s. And mm -hmm. um, they approached it with a wisdom that was, you know, you just can't glean that from <laughs> a younger generation. Just squeezed you know? out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're right. Like, Ha, you know, having a, a, a wide age, age range is um is going to yield more interesting results ultimately and what you see from people too, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of your company and what you're doing, you know, one of the things that I've always wondered and, I, you know, in, in talking to sculptors is the, the commercial side of it. It seems to be like usually a big stumbling block for a lot of artists. It's like, okay, how do I monetize this? What is my time worth? And, and like all art, I find most artists start by devaluing themselves very low in order to get the product out there and, and build that, that line. And that's, that's tough because in the commercial world, you don't have to do that. Yeah. It's hours times material times markup. That's the price. You don't like it. Walk. Right. And artists don't generally think like that. How do you approach the pricing or the promotion of your work? Well, I think, that that was how I priced my work straight out of commercial shops. The problem was that back then it would take me 300 hours to build a sculpture. <laughs> so they were extremely expensive, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm paying myself $25 an hour, uh, yeah. which I don't know that I've ever made more than that on a sculpture, to be honest, you know, mm -hmm. um, it really is hard to do, but um I got tired of my work being too expensive. And so I think that that was a big part. That was a big draw to blacksmithing too, was that mm -hmm. I knew that I could get there faster. And yeah, okay. if I, if I could establish those forms instead of cutting a bunch of tubes and shrinking them down, like then I would be uh, able to, that it would just cut the time of the sculpture. Yeah. Build, just a turnaround. Know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, there was that that really helped me and um, having a better understanding of like what the market can bear, you know, and actually I'm, 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 I've, I've recently had two of my pieces go to auction and, and go for like, it surprised me. I was like, I'm not mm -hmm. charging enough for my work, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's hard to move stuff, especially right now in this economy, like people are really, you know, scared to spend money and you start yeah. to see those trends. Um, so uh yeah, I mean, I, I think now I'm pricing more about, and especially having a larger body of work, I have more like ability to compare pieces and that mm -hmm. helps me understand where they should be at a specific price range. You know, it's very yeah. hard, very hard. It to is. Work. Yeah. Like I'm looking at your website, so I'm on your website and I was looking through it and like, I mean, there's things on here that I, I love and it's like, oh, this beetle brooch, I would love to wear that on a suit somewhere. <laughs> and, but you know, it's, and, but it's like, like, like there's like art jewelry and then there's yeah. artist jewelry. Yeah. Right. So if I go to an art jeweler, they'll have this brooch and I can just click add to cart, mm -hmm. yellow ship, PayPal here in five days. 
right? An artist's website is not like that. It is like, this is my body of work. Yeah. If you're interested, reach out and start the process, right? Yeah. Now, now you're looking at, you know, you're building fives ofs and you're, you're building, I would call maybe collections as you know, I think the word that they use, they build these collections in order to move things a little bit better and in, or in, in, a, in a, in a vibe. Do you see yourself having maybe a piece of your business being the ready to go buy on a shopping cart aspect? Yes, I do. Um, mm -hmm. it, with those little guys, I put them into my store and people could just purchase them and I would just get an email saying, oh, so-and-so bought this piece, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I also believe in like price transparency. I used to not have prices on my website and I feel like I personally, like if I, if I have to ask and then I can't afford it, you know, I don't want that person to think that I just don't think their work is worth that. So I feel like putting prices on there is really helpful for people. Mm -hmm. um, when I finish these pitcher plant monsters that I'm making right now, those are going to go into the store and people are going to be able to just put those in the cart. When it comes to something that's kind of standard like that, it's easy for me to put it into a mailing tube or a smaller box and ship it out. Um, but with like a bigger sculpture, there's no way I have to have a conversation with you. How yeah, there's logistics. You? Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. not just that simple, you know. Um, but the jewelry stuff, the I I am I do tend to put some belt buckles up, but uh, you know, my jewelry is uh, I was never good at making jewelry, so I I don't really sell it. Go because, back there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And then in terms of, you know, and this is, I've been trying to kind of like bounce around this because I didn't like going there with the other people very much. Cause this isn't really what the show is about, but in terms of your experience with metal shop masters, like, I mean, there's a show I've had many views expressed by the different, I've, I think you're, uh, I think there's only one person other than you, or maybe two that I haven't gotten from the show already interviewed on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because everyone's had a very different view and aspect of how the show went, right? Yeah. Like for real, not just like ratings, right? And one of the things that I struggle with watching that show is, and this is like the musician in me, my level of understanding art, is how do you rate someone else's art? You know, like me walking into a room being like, man, nah, bad. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Man, good. Right? Like yeah. And and and, and it's like and, and not even in the same realm. Like this was done this way, this was done this way. Like I yeah. in a, in a fabrication shop, I can say, "Okay, I'm building 56 widgets. I can pick out the two widgets that don't fit." Right? But this isn't that. Like uh, art competitions for me are very tricky. Even cooking competitions I watch, I'm like, I'm sure I'd like all of them. You know, like yeah. <laughs> So yeah. it's like you start getting nitty-gritty. Was that experience for you? Because I think you may be the only one on that show with like the level of art education that you had. No, oh, maybe I don't. I might have. I'm not sure, but you know, you have a high either. level. Yeah, you have a high level of art education. So, did you have a des like initially when you got the ask to be on the show? Did you have a a desire to not participate in something like that that was so competitive, or were you like, you know what, I'm gonna go for it? Um. Yeah, I think at first I was reticent, but not because of my education. And that was like this, that that was, you know, sort of out of the above realm. or below or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was more about the fact that I didn't think I could do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my sculptures <laughs> take a really long time. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to be able to build something in, in three days know, or whatever. hours yeah, or whatever, yeah. you know, 10 hours. Um, and they, yeah, I mean, the reason that I did it was because I felt like it was important for young people to get excited about the work and to see that there's a lot of us and we're all very different, you know? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that that was sort of the value added there for me was just getting out there and um, yeah. But I mean, I was, I was reluctant just for the sake that I was like, this is going to be too hard. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. And I, I love the, I love the idea of the show. I love that yeah. the show exists I hope there's more of them because in my world now, what I'm do is I'm trying to create a, a level of celebrity and I'm not talking about me or you. I'm talking about the concept of celebrity. 
mm-hmm. where, you know, I can watch Hollywood movies and there's lawyers and there's the paramedic and then there's the show and then there's the there's the airline pilot, but there's never the welder. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's welders don't make the celebrity list or there's not songs written about welding and there's songs written about carpenters and painters, but not so why are welders not there? And I think it's a whole larger societal conditioning that we haven't made that level where a welder can be cool or a welder can be rich or a welder can be famous or a welder can be a movie star or a welder can be a whatever. And yeah. I think that that's important for especially the young generation now that it's so digitally inclined that if you didn't see a welder 40 years ago, you're definitely not going to see one now because, yeah. you know, it's it's not there. So I'm, I think that it's great when I see welders like doing the TikToks and the Instagrams and because we should be the steel industry, steel workers, steel people. We should be as visible as anything else. Right. And when you have 60,000 cooking shows and 40,000 home reno shows, um, why do we not have 15, you know, welding shows when it's such a fascinating medium, you know, we border on it, like with like Ian's tire garage and Jesse's James and the pit, my rides, you know, we border on metal work through other mediums like cars or motorcycles. But that was kind of like the first one that was like straight up steel, you know, we're just working with steel and I think that that's a benefit to the industry. Yeah, I I agree with you. That was another big part of it for me. Like we've, we've seen that happen with chefs, right. With like top chefs, Mm -hmm. like now there's celebrity chefs, you know, Mm -hmm. and they, there's like, there's probably more, uh, chefing happening in like the zeitgeist, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of funny you say that because like, I, I watched a, a Simpsons episode and a Bob's Burgers episode that both talked about metal sculptures. And I was like, oh, my God, we've made <laughs> it's it. It's happening. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I think that um, e- even in the art world, which like, you know, what, I don't not really even sure what that means. I'm just t- talking from my own experience, like mm-hmm. getting into galleries or getting into museums or whatever, like metal artists are still very marginalized and like not understood at all um and why is that what what's i feel like metal again total bias yeah metal's the best medium in the world it's soft, I agree. it's hard it's malleable yeah. it's ductile it's freezable it's crackable it's shatterable and like literally everything you've ever wanted is in one material yeah it's, I, and I, th- I i think that that's the that's the thing that needs to be that has yet to be uh, really out there in, Exposed, in a bigger way, you know, you know because you know. I think when, when I think of people uh, and their understanding of what metal sculpture is, I watch them take an I beam from a skyscraper and bend like, it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like it's, you know, it was an industrial material that got repurposed in this time and place. And I still think that people see that mostly as a, you know, steel is used for monuments and steel is Mm -hmm. structural steel isn't pretty steel is gorgeous you know Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. so i think that there's um well i mean i'm doing my best to try to you know Mm -hmm. turn turn the tides of what we think can be done glamorize it you know yeah because it deserves to be it's yeah look at what madero is doing with those yeah like dot by dot with mig wire and a heat torch like oh my god just watching his clips <laughs> makes me get anxious i'm like oh i can do it like, <laughs> he's been working on this for 18 hours and he's going a half inch like <laughs> yeah yeah but we do it because we love it and we love the material mm-hmm. and i do like his work because of the uh the way that you can really still see the material you know mm-hmm. i kind of get dinged sometimes not necessarily dinged but asked like why do you why do you even work in steel if you're just going to treat it like clay, you know, why don't you just do it in clay? And you know, the, yeah. you're like, you don't get it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, because I like working in steel, first of all, it's my yeah. favorite thing to do. Um, but also like, it's, it's much stronger than clay. You can't do dynamic, crazy, narrow pieces in clay. They're just going to break. So yeah. there's like an object permanence to it that we haven't really uh, come to understand as well. That's what I some, guess. Uh... That's what someone said to me in one of the previous podcasts. He does uh, sculptures in stainless steel. And this guest said, I love the thought that I can make a sculpture that'll outlast the pyramids of 
you know, Giza. Like, yeah. uh, like you know, like art has been around since the dawn of man. And we've been, in his view, kind of like using the wrong medium. Like everyone's using pottery and glass and wood. And you make all these beautiful things. In 500 years, it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. You know, like even these beautiful pyramids, they were like the biggest art pieces ever on the planet. It's took thousands of years to build and they've crumbled to ruin. If they would have built those out of steel, yeah, they'd be in perfect <laughs> condition today. And so yeah. he builds these like big sculptures out of stainless specifically for that purpose because he loves the thought like after we've decimated ourselves and the earth's come to death and the aliens show up 30,000 years or 300,000 years in the future, they'll be digging through and they'll be like, hey, what's this? And it'll be like a perfectly <laughs> preserved, you know, sculpture in stainless steel and be like, what? And that I, I that kind of blew me away thinking about that. I'm like, I like that idea. I like I, that I love the that permanence idea. of like, it. Yeah. Yes. I, I and also just the idea of your narrative. Like, I wonder what the aliens will think and what kind mm -hmm. of narratives they'll build around that and what they'll think of our culture. They must have worshipped fang toothed <laughs> dragons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I want to see that movie too. I think yeah. Was, yeah, like aliens coming down and doing archaeological digs. Yeah. Of our metal sculptures. <laughs> that would be like, just totally the wrong view about us. It'll be the only things that last, right? And, and why yeah. are there all these bent eye beams everywhere? What do they mean? Like... <laughs> <laughs> so you know, was it an ex a positive experience to show? Would you? Would you? Yeah. You yeah. felt good about it. I, I feel like there was a good click. I know that uh, everyone kind of still talks to each other. Um, I met Stephanie Hoffman kind of just reaching out through through a show and now she's we've done a few projects together she's awesome so like uh, it's I feel like it was a good click and I have no yeah. idea if they're doing more of them uh, yeah neither do I um but no. uh yeah I mean I it was overall a really positive experience for me and mm -hmm. um how did you do I don't remember not great <laughs> No, were you no, like first no. out, third out? I, I was halfway? second out. I was second oh, yeah. out. Yeah. Um, what was the project that you did that got you punted? It was a barbecue. <laughs> mm, to, didn't someone do a yeah. fish barbecue? We all did fish barbecues to a Oh, is that what it was? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I remember Stephanie being like, I have never, <laughs> they were like, use a food that's a barbecue item. And she was like, I've never been to a barbecue that like, serve fish, fish per se <laughs> like this is very weird um but yeah me and me and frank were a team and we did oh like he a, did the ribs or whatever wrap. no no he did a um, oh, we, he did suitcase a case thing yes yeah banana leaf wrapper um it was one of those things where you're you get the project and you're trying to figure out how you're going to do that in 10 hours and you know i made a choice that didn't like yield a very visual impact <laughs> for w how much for time, time I spent yeah. on it, you know, yeah. um, which is probably a valuable lesson for people to see that, like, you can spend a lot of time in fa in a fabrication shop and get nowhere. <laughs> and get nowhere, <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was fun. Number one, what's the number one rule of fab? Be ready to cut it out. Never be too scared to cut it apart. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's just better to start over, right? Yeah, that's true. So now what's the, the, you know, what's the future state for yourself? You know, you got your, your business going, you're kind of expanding and getting into the more, a little bit more commercial lines. And now this new experience with, you know, be, you know, giving classes and mentoring, where, where do you see yourself in the future? What's the, if you could pick the, the movie role of your future life, what would it be like? Oh man, that's a, that's a hard I, I mean, I, I, if I'm being totally honest, I feel like I'm I'm living it. Like I I feel mm -hmm. very appreciated and um and I'm having such a great time making the work that I am. I think that what I'd like to do is continue to grow and learn, and um that maybe I'll just be a, a an older, wiser uh, version more, of you. Yeah. yeah, with more experience and more to offer the younger generation every year. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and to have been a really good mentor to at least a few people in yeah. my lifetime. Is there an arts collective in your area that you can be more involved with as an option for like steelworking? Yeah, I mean, there's a big, uh, well, yeah, the Bay Area is known to be a huge hub for metal artists in general. We mm -hmm. A lot of the Burning Man sculptures get built here, so yeah. Um, there the crucible is 
like a really great arts education space that's just down the street from my shop. And um, they have a, a, a pretty cool art culture there as well. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's there's many. I can kind of take my pick. Yeah, good. Yeah. And then just the last few questions here that just are interesting for me. You know, how do you find, and it's just probably a generic question you get all the time, but how do you find inspiration for the things you do? Because I love the creepy curly vibe. We're a horror house. Like we, nice. me, my kids, my, my wife, all of us, we like dig Halloween. We watch horror movies all year round. Like, I mean, it's almost every day. Any yeah. new movie, horror movie, like it's, we dig creepy and scary. And I've been looking at your stuff and it's, I've been like, oh, I should buy that for my wife. She totally loves that. <laughs> But like that stuff comes from somewhere, you know, like there's a, yeah. there's a vibe there. And where do you think yours is rooted in? Well, like going back to what I was saying before, like my childhood mm -hmm. hanging out in some swamps and abandoned buildings and stuff, it really kind of settled in and was fairly formative in my aesthetic, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I, since I grew up in such a small town. Like I was, I was a late bloomer as far as, understanding that I was a sci-fi nerd so oh, I mean I, yeah. I read a ton of science fiction I also watch a lot of horror um and have you so, read Robert Jordan Eye of the World no I'm gonna read put it. it on my list though <laughs> yeah it's a great series fantastic series they just re released the show on Prime it got made into a show finally it got the rights got bought like 15 years ago they just did the first season I'm read the books okay Definitely. Yeah. Robert Jordan. Yeah. I'm on the Hyperion series right now. Oh, those are great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm really digging it so far. Um, so yeah, so I think there's that. There's the the sci-fi element and then just, you know, observing us as people and how we are and uh And you like insects. You tie insect you. form into many of the pieces. Yeah. Well, I think that that's I do like insects and also their exoskeletal uh alien is she yeah. yeah they're very alien yeah. and they also lend really well to steel and that it's an you know you're, you're not watching me sculpt fur and you probably never will see me sculpt fur oh so metal I fur that this. would be wild <laughs> i don't know maybe we'll see <laughs> if you could just drip mig wire off the end of a table and catch those strands yeah yeah something <laughs> not, not that i would have turning. any of skill to do that you should see i build a fire pit and it's like look it's square wow like, <laughs> that's hard to do hard to well do. i'm good at making squares i am a, i'm a i'm a i'm an industrial builder because i get laughed at all the time because my friends are always like oh you're a welder yeah you know. i work commercial i've worked commercial my whole life i'm a that's my gig yeah but it doesn't mean i don't love to try and i have a, my welders here and, and i i do make things for people and i'm very self-conscious about them because i don't think they're very great and i always feel like people are like oh thank you it's beautiful i'm like yeah, is it really <laughs> it looks kind of like and then i go onto websites like you're i'm like no it's actually garbage <laughs> <laughs> i have i feel that way too i feel that way too um so well, I, maybe let's talk about that on the way out. Like, what would you say, like, as a mentor, mentor role now, and I'm the fresh, you know, and I won't say young because age doesn't have anything to do with the experience. I'm, you know, 47 years old, just trying to get into art, and I'm coming to your class. What, what would you tell me about my insecurities of art? That you're not alone, and that everyone feels that way, and if they don't, they probably should. To us, I think that's a good. I think it's an important motivator for us to not be sure if this is the best thing we ever made. Ideally, we learn something there that will go into the next piece and the next piece and the next piece. I remember when I was in art school, and I was very protective over my work that I was doing there. And my my mentors were like, "You're not going to give a shit about this, these sculptures, you know? Like, yeah, ten years gonna, from now, you're not even going to remember." You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. You know, I think that that's a healthy instinct because it's what drives you to learn more, you know, um, and that like that will serve you well. Okay, good. I feel better already. Thank you. Good. <laughs> good. <laughs> I do have to build a fire pit this week, but a friend of mine donated me a bunch of pipe cutouts. So I think I want to make it in the shape of a flower. I think it just yes. naturally works that way. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into it. <laughs> and then I'm going to try to paint it. Uh, that's my... I'm a terrible painter. Like even just painting like a house, I'm just like, 
Painting <laughs> requires patience, like yeah. supreme patience. Yeah. Paint should dry faster, in my opinion. But anyways, I now, agree. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, to wrap up the show, there's, a, there's, I would like to ask you, because I think you have a great example of someone who's in art, but also, I would say, um, business minded. You know, you have your shop. You, you feel like you're coming to the cusp of being, you know, self-maintained, which is the dream of any business owner. Like I, I, I don't think my first shop made money for six years. I think I was still working yeah. night jobs at the convenience stores, but it is what it is. You know, hitting that cusp where you're like, okay, now I can actually pay the bills and move forward is huge. So from that point of view, what would you say, or what advice would you give a young artist that's looking to make a run at it? You know, like in terms of, making money and actually not just a hobby. This is a career that I'm looking to, to hopefully someday sustain myself with. What kind of pieces of advice would you give as starting points? I think that the most important thing is to just keep going um, and to not give up because if you keep doing the work and you keep putting in the time and you keep improving, you're just going to be putting yourself at better odds of succeeding. And we all do what we have to do to be able to do the work that we want to do. Um, and if you can get through that and it's still fun and enjoyable for you to do your work, um, then it shouldn't be hard to keep doing it and keep going. I know that it can be like a really thankless job sometimes and it's hard to make money at it. And, you know, not everyone is going to love what you do, but uh, if you're having fun, just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> and find that patron that can give you a million dollars a year. Yeah, that's important too. <laughs> <laughs> that's ideal. <laughs> that's ideal. Let's talk ideal state and reality. <laughs> Somewhere yeah. in the middle there. <laughs> All right. Well, I've had a lot, a lot of fun uh, having you on the show. This has been a great interview. I think we could probably talk for another hour, but yeah. I get dinged if I go too long because people say that no one listens to long podcasts. I don't know if that's true or not, but people tell me. Um, you know, you do the shout outs. What's your Instagram? What's your website? Uh, what are what are the what's the deets on your stuff? Uh, yeah. So my everything is just my first and last name. L E A H A R I P O T C H dot com or at that for Instagram. And uh, that's where you can find me. Is that the, the two main venues is Instagram and, yeah. uh, and your website? Okay. Yeah. All right. That's how I found you. So yeah, <laughs> Instagram is great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good for the, for the networking, which is, it's huge and, 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 and important. It's important. I think so too. I think it's also going to bring us together and uh, make welding more visible to the world as well too. Mm -hmm. So Awesome. Well, I've had, I loved having you on the show. Is there anything last words you'd have for anybody Any last comments for anybody? Uh, yeah, no, just, uh, just make sure you're having fun and enjoying awesome. what you do and then everything else will come in time. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you to the audience that always tunes into our shows. We're having lots of fun. Um, I think this is actually the kickoff. You know, I should have said that this, I think this is kickoff season three, this episode. Cool. So thanks <laughs> nice. for all the people that have been listening up my, my podcast. My editor's going to be like, you're supposed to start with that. Okay. So thank you for all the people that have been tuning in. We were having lots of fun. We're ramping up for another huge season. We're going to have lots of stuff. We're going to be at FabTech in Atlanta. We're going to be traveling around doing the road show again. We've got works with Jason Becker coming up for some more. Uh, back and forth with the arc junkies and we're always looking for fun stuff and uh, you know it's all about community and networking so that's what we're trying to support here at the CWB Association so everyone take care and I'll see you at the next podcast we hope you enjoyed the show 